On this episode of The Live Life, we're talking about one of the more important parts of the live event business operation, project management, and more on The Live Life. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by... Christy Digital, and by SDVOE, the platform for network AV. This is The Live Life, episode 33, the importance of project management for live events. Welcome to The Live Life, where we bring you influential people to discuss topics related to the selling, planning, designing, producing, and delivering live event productions. I'm your host, Wallace Johnson, where you can find me on Twitter at WallaceCTS. And on today's episode, we're going to discuss the importance of project management for live event companies. And joining me today to discuss this topic is the staff instructor at Avixa, Andre Lejeune. Andre, welcome to The Live Life. Well, thank you very much, Wallace, and good morning to you. Good morning, good morning. So, Andre, before we get into the main topic, I I want the audience just to get a little bit of your background, which from looking at LinkedIn, I see spans over 45 years in the live event industry. Ooh, I got to change that. (laughs) (laughs) So to talk about your background a little bit, just share with the audience, like from, from the beginning of time, how you got into the industry. Well, you know, it it was quite by accident, and I know I'm really dating myself now, but my first stage show that I put together, I was a junior in high school. Uh, It was for the chorus and the band, and uh, there were complaints, and of course, sound systems back in the day weren't very good, and neither were lighting, so I had gotten a small budget from my high school and actually went out and rented sound and lighting gear. I, 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 I won't I won't debate the success of the event. I was probably pretty much lost, but it kind of set the tone for how things were going to go. And it it totally caught me by surprise. And I found out I really enjoyed it. So, I mean, that was the first one. And as, as I moved on into college, I started working the shows for free, the concerts that were coming in, just trying to get an opportunity to get in and to learn. And so I guess that's where it's all started. Um, I spent the first 10 years of my career doing concert touring, which was wonderful. Uh, But after 10 years of that, that ages you 25. (laughs) And I got back uh, off the road and I was an audiovisual company called me. And I said, my goodness, overhead projectors and 16 millimeter film. What would they possibly need me for? But what was happening was the uh, AV presentations were starting to get larger. Instead of just being in boardrooms and instead of 16 millimeter, we were experimenting with video. Gee, we had 500 lumen projectors back there, most of which you probably never heard of. And they were starting to do large sound and large lighting. So the opportunity came for me to get off the road, actually have an apartment, you know, a a couple of plants, (laughs) a meaningful relationship that lasted longer than one or two nights. And I never went back to the road uh, on that. I spent plenty of time on the road doing AV, but I found out it was a much more comfortable lifestyle. Uh, than the earlier days were. <laughs> <laughs> a similar story of so many. Yes. So, you know, after being in the industry for so long, what is it that you love about being in, in on, particularly on the live event side where you've spent like a focus of most of your career? What is it that you love about it? You know, I didn't know at first what it was, but it, it, I had been in it several years before I realized uh, the main difference between doing the, the road work that I was doing. I was working with professional artists in those years. And suddenly I was thrust into audiovisual where we have people that once or twice a year have to get up in front of an audience and speak and are usually scared to death. It ended up being more of a how to deal with the artist or in this case, the presenter than anything else. And that was the challenge. The challenge wasn't so much the gear. We had worked with that for years. It was trying to get these people who were scared to death just to get on stage. And we had to alter the way we started dealing with the talent and I, I use that term loosely. <laughs> yes, yeah, so with a lot of volunteers speaking in this industry, I, I, I certainly understand that. <laughs> I know. And, and of course, their success reflected our success or lack of it. And we all have horror stories from the industry about a presenter who 
were so busy busy listening to themselves over the PA system that they were fumbling their words or they were banging their wedding ring on the lectern because they were so nervous to people being scared, uh, getting moving out of the light when we were trying to shoot them on video and the, we were on the uh, headphones to the stage manager, get them back in the light and people just weren't used to doing this. And it, it was nice occasionally when we worked with the professional groups, but most of the time it was people from hometown. It was people who just weren't used to doing this and it was a challenge to try and make these things come off in a professional manner. That's the only thing I can really think of that kind of drew me into that side of the business. So if you had to go back and give your younger self some advice or, you know, give some advice to somebody new coming to the live event side of the industry, what would it be? Develop the ability to predict the future. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry if that sounds trite, but most of it was what if. What if, and what if this happens and this doesn't happen? And over time, we learned that it was as much as dealing with the venue and the people there that contributed to the success or the failure of the event. Uh, in, In the entertainment industry, we owned the stage. We owned everything. We did put everything wherever we wanted. We ran it however we wanted. The sound and the lights were the primary thing that had to be done. And suddenly we had a lot more considerations when we moved into audio visual. We weren't the number one thing. And it was the client's inability to plan or it was some of the strange things that they used to do that formed the background of stories that we used to go to the bar afterwards and talk about. I mean, even little things like a, a client deciding at the last minute that they were spending all of this money on table decorations for a huge dinner, 500 people, great AV presentation, the whole nine yards. At 4.30 in the afternoon, they started bringing in these three foot tall fiber optic centerpieces for all of the dinner tables and they stood three foot tall and even the client as we noticed went no one is going to be able to see the stage and the client was very upset we have spent thousands of dollars on these gorgeous battery operated fiber optic table decorations and even they realized that no one was going to be able to see over them to even find out what was going on on the stage and so it was it was the av crew that came up with the solution. They got with the hotel, they had them bring out a bunch of serpentine tables, which they lined either wall, the side walls of the ballroom, and put all of these 150 uh, fiber optic displays against the wall, which solved the problem. The client did not waste their money, and the audience actually got to see the stage. But considering uh, all this stuff started coming in about 4.30 in the afternoon and doors were set to open at 6.30, that's the nature of our business in AV. No matter how well we plan, um, the client is always going to be the one that's going to do something at the end that we're going to have to work a little bit harder to make come off. Uh, And that's just one example. And most people in our industry have run into this before. Things that have nothing to do with what we do, we actually end up helping and taking responsibility for. The show must go on. show must go on. That's a uh, a great point for the the newbies of the uh, the industry coming in to be aware of. So let's jump into our main topic, project management. And we're going we're gonna to scale and try to focus on a couple of core things because me and you can talk days about this subject and there's so many layers. <laughs> and, and trust me, we will. We will have multiple episodes about it. Um, but to lay the groundwork on the topic, can you define the function of project management? Like what is project management? Um, from how you would define it for our audience? Well, you know, if you look at it straight out of the book, um, it is a proven set of principles to successfully execute a project. Now, that's it in one sentence. And, and of course, that barely uh, scratches the surface. But project management doesn't care if you're doing an AV show, building a, a super highway, or opening a flower shop. It will not tell you how to do it. It provides a proven set of principles of how to get through it. The biggest thing we deal with, I think, in Pro-AV is like what most live events deal with, risk. And that is what finally made me uh, buy into project management. Through the entire planning phase, you're going, what if? What if this does? What if this doesn't? And PM gives you a set of principles 
that lets you look at this in advance. And I think that's when, I mean, the first time they brought me into a, a PMP, a project management professional who was helping design a course that we were working with at Avixa, I walked in there with my arms folded and a frown on my face. Like, okay, now what are you going to tell me? There's no way we can plan everything that happens on these shows. If the client decides at the last minute they want to bring in an eight-foot elephant and the doors are only six foot high, what are you going to do? And I mean, I'm picking from the sublime to the ridiculous. But what it helped us was it helped us start seeing things, and it's not something you learn once. Project management is a set of tools that an AV company needs to use regularly to build up a history. It doesn't help you just plan and execute an event. Uh, and one of the things we say, one of the best benefits of project management is at the end of the year, you're supposed to go back through all of these things you did for your major shows, the shows that bring you the most amount of income, the shows you do the most of, and keep a record of them. And once or twice a year, you sit down and look at all of these forms and, and things that project management asks you to do, and it will tell you things about your company. In one of my first classes with PM, uh, I'd gotten an email from a, a, a guest about six months later, and they said, we found something unusual when we were starting to work in project management. It told us which jobs made the company the most profit and which ones that we were spending more than we were making. It also told us errors we were making in our crewing. In other words, well, I need 10 guys. Well, why? <laughs> Well, I need 10 guys because that's what I used on the last show and that worked for me. Well, th that's fine, but you can't make a living off of that. And the idea is, and especially nowadays, and I don't have to tell you this from your job, the client is very, very careful about when they see people not doing anything on a live event. And most of the larger companies, like I learned that lesson a long time ago, if the crew's not doing anything, get them off the stage during set off. In other words, the client, uh, no matter what they're paying for the building, for the catering, for the, for the crew, for the AV, they're watching their budgets much more carefully. And how efficient we are now has a lot to do with whether or not we are asked back. And it, it's a tenuous situation. It always has been. But nowadays, especially in the situation, Wallace, where there's so much less lead time. I mean, we used to get a couple of months out on a big event. Now they call three weeks before the show and they want to bid by tomorrow morning. No, that, and that segues to kind of what my next thought was, you know, you've been around the industry for so long. How have you seen project management evolve over your career? Like what are the things that have changed um, in and around project management specifically for, you know, the live event community? To be honest with you, learning what everyone else does that have absolutely nothing to do with what we're doing, but can affect us. And this is something that Avixa has taken in there. Avixa practices project management principles and also it's the design and installation area as well as live events. We need to know what's going on in the building. In other words, if we're going in to do a big show, it's not enough to just say, all right, we'll show up at eight o'clock in the morning, have everything ready for us. And the companies have to make decisions on when they do a site survey, when it's important. Now, people say, you know, I've worked this, I've worked the every hall in my town for 20 or 30 times. I know how to do it. But the first time you go out of town or the first time you go into a venue you're not used to, one of the first things I want to know when I would go into a venue was what else is going on? What other shows or events are happening? What am I going to have in terms of, am I going to have enough risers to build my stage? And it wouldn't be the first time we've gone in saying we needed 24, 36 inch risers and only 12 showed up because the other 40 were being used in other parts of the building. This is not something you wait until you arrive on setup day to find out. When can you get into the room? When are the stages set? Who else is going? What, what are the crew availabilities? How busy is the house crew? And we started encompassing things that had more than to do with just our end of the business. And trying to talk a boss into flying two people to do a site survey is a cost problem with an employer, and we understand that. And one of the hardest things we used to have to do was getting the boss to okay letting a couple of us go look at the gig. Uh, it might be a two-hour plane flight. It's definitely going to affect the profit margin if the boss has to send us and pay for hotels and everything else. But it, normally after they've been burnt bad enough, 
a hierarchy is set up and the company knows, all right, this is something, look, this is three meeting rooms, each with a small projector and a small sound system. We don't really need to send anyone there. But if the client is going to do a huge production in a hotel or a convention center that we're not familiar with, we've seen designs had to be changed along the way. Well, if we don't look at the room, well, the, you know, we looked at the, at the beautiful glossy hotel um, uh, uh, publicity shots of their rooms. And whenever you look at their ballrooms, you don't see anything like columns. You see this gorgeous open space. That's right. Per perfect conditions to bring your meeting. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's not until you get there that you realize that the ceiling is only 20 feet high in the center. And two soffits drop down, one on each side, bringing the ceiling down to usable of 12 feet. And the client's original idea was to have three huge screens placed across the room. Well, that just killed that. Those are the type of things a client is not looking at. They are, most of them are not inside our business. They don't understand. That's what they're paying us to do, is to tell them what's going to work in here and what's not. Is it going to be a meal function? How is the room going to be set? How many people are you going to be putting at rounds? We've seen AV companies, and we've heard some stories about this, where the, the venue actually thought they could put 14 people at a six-foot round for dinner. <laughs> and uh, we very politely say this is a physical impossibility to put 14 people at a six-foot round. We have problems where they can't put enough people in the room that they had specified, and they're starting to encroach on the position of our stage. And we go down to do the site survey, and it's a classroom situation, right? Tables and chairs for lectures that are going to have to do with some typical business application. Only in this particular case, the venue was not using true classroom tables, which are 18 inches wide. They had substituted banquet tables, which are 30 inches wide. And again, what the heck does this have to do with AV? Nothing at all. Right. But there's times when I work for companies where we've had to sh do a CAD drawing for the client just to show them what they wanted to do would not work in the room. So it's interesting that you highlight, you know, of the evolution of project management that, you know, in today's world, your thinking has to be beyond the core things within your company that you're responsible for. You really got to look at external factors of the environment. And, and the client responsibilities that affect what you're responsible for and be more engaged and more detailed um, with that information. So kind of the next direction I want to go is the, the characteristics or the makeup of a project manager. And, you know, over the years, you know, you hear the, the stories of guys who have just been around and they've been there the longest and done the most shows. So now the you know, next trajectory on the org chart is project management because you got to move up yes. uh, or the guy who is the best tech who needs to move up. So we're going to make him a project manager, even though he's just really just a good audio guy. That's often um, where they come from. Right. <laughs> um, the characteristics like the makeup, the personality traits, the skill traits, what makes a good project manager today with, with what you kind of just described as the evolution of project management, what does a good project management look like today? Well, it's interesting. And uh, you had made a comment a moment ago, which I took very well. Very oftentimes, your next generations of project managers can be the people who are now your A1s or your L1s or your V1s that have done enough shows and are starting to learn. But it's a different mindset for the project manager. That's what it boils down to. In other words, a technician <laughs> seeks optimal solution. In other words, the coolest thing I can do with my craft, the best look or the best sound or the best video. Project manager is looking more at pragmatic decisions. Not quite as interested in, in the bells and whistles, but relating to matters of fact. All righty. That's one of the things. Another thing they do is well, a technician will strive for precision a project manager is looking for freedom from mistakes or errors. So while one can cross to the other one, it is definitely a different set of principles. I mean, technicians normally deal with things, equipment. Project managers got to deal with people. And I mean, there's a whole list of the things that separate the technical people. Now, I, I, like I said, if you can find someone who can do both sides of it, that's golden. 
who recognizes the challenges of the technical things the client asks us to do, but also is not getting so caught up in the pageantry that they forget. They, they generalize to improve while a technician specializes to improve. Project manager is interested. How's the client going to do this? How many layers are there? I mean, you might not, you might have several bosses within one client on one show. I'm sure you run into that many, many times. And sometimes they're fighting with each other. And you've got three vice presidents all telling you to do something different. Change this color to this, change, move this around to here. And they're fussing with each other. One of the best uh, stories that I had ever been involved in and, and uh, was one time we were coming into a ballroom and the project manager was with me and um, he, we, we cracked the door and we saw the clients fighting with each other. And I mean, yelling and screaming. And I said, man, we better get in there right now and do something about this. He says, no, wait. I said, come on, man, we, we got to get in there. It looks like they're about to throw punches. He says, no, wait. <laughs> so we stood out there for about five minutes until the screaming stopped. And then we walked in. And I learned a good lesson there. Most people cannot yell at the top of their lungs longer than about five minutes. They run out of steam. And we don't want to be attached to that loud argument that's going on in the room. We're there to help. We're there to serve. So by him keeping us out there about five minutes until they calmed down, then we walked in. By that time, the hullabaloo was over and the people were ready to talk. And I learned an excellent lesson from there. Sometimes it's better to know when not to be somewhere than it is to be in the middle of something. And I know this sounds like more like a Dale Carnegie course than anything else, but it's true. We're dealing with people who are under a lot of stress. They're being, the client is being asked to perform by his or her boss and their jobs may depend on this. And that's one of the things that I move, found when I moved into AV that we did not have to deal with as much when we were dealing with professional artists in a concert or other type of situation. And that's just a, a lot of the things they do. I mean, a technician succeeds individually in his or her craft. The project manager succeeds through his or her influence on others. And that is what the client will take away. And that's what brings a client back. It's not the gear. Most of the people that we work with in AV, our clients that is, you can't impress them with the brand of video projector we have or the type of line array we're using because that's not inside outside their business. Uh, you see what I'm getting at? Uh, you can't do that. You have to do something that makes them feel like we like this company mainly because they pulled our butt out of the fire several times along the way. And that would keeps, that's what keep a, keeps a client. Sorry, I was on a coffee rant there. The last, <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Cause like I say, it's a good segue. Cause you know, you talk about the char characteristics of what makes up a good project manager, um, you know, from the now doing the actual role. Uh, you, you hit on a few points there um, in terms of what are critical functions in the role a project manager must be capable of. Dealing with people and people skills, kind of a, you know, big thing, one, maybe one of the most important things um, outside of others like organization and, and things like that. So, you know, to dive into kind of the critical functions of what the actual role is doing, um, what are some of those more critical functions um, outside of the, the people skills and the organizational skills that a project manager must be able to do? Well, and if I might borrow a line that you suggested to me when we had spoken the other day, Wallace, um, you were talking about creep, whether it be scope creep, time creep, <laughs> It boils down, and project manager is huge on this, you have to have an, an effective change management plan. And this is one of the key uh, uh, support columns of project management. You have to go in from the beginning saying what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. And that is the purpose of the scope statement. People say, well, a scope statement just gives you a list of the equipment and stuff. Well, no, it does more than that. It not only tells the client what we're going to do, it also tells them what must be provided by others based on the agreement we have. That all gets forgotten when you get into the heat of battle on show site. Oh, yes. So the company that makes sure their scope statement has two parts, what we will do based on our agreement and what must be done by others, that can stop a lot of headaches right in their tracks. And the company that doesn't do that 
can leave themselves wide open when the client on show side is going, says, well, we assume that because you did this, you are also going to do this. Well, you know the old saying about assumptions. We must be very clear. And, uh, you know, normally you get a quick example of, I mean, well, give me an example of scope creep. Well, um, you say, you know, the power must be provided by the building. And you go to do the site survey and you find out the building doesn't have enough power located where we need it. That has to be taken care of then. You don't want to wait until you get to show site and found that out. Now, I'm, I'm picking, I'm just picking things out of the air here. But we have another show loading in and you can't get your trucks in at eight o'clock in the morning. Well, that's our responsibility to find out what's going on. One of the things we used to say is never, never unload a truck at a hotel venue at eight o'clock on a weekday. Because if you do, if you do, you have to remember that most convention hotels will co-opt most of the freight elevators to use for room service. So what you find out is, and this is, this happens all over the world, everywhere I've traveled, I've seen this. There's nothing worse than having, you know, you know, eight, stage hands out there ready to unload your trucks and you've only got one elevator to put them in. It seems like a little thing, but you told the client we were supposed to, we got into the building at eight o'clock by nine 30, our truck should be un unloaded in the room. Client walks in at nine 40 and they're not, you just lost credibility and you haven't even gotten the darn equipment in the room yet. Those are the things we're sensitive to is how the client will react. So anything we can do on the front end to let them know, I mean, and, and the case is very simple. We shouldn't make the load in for eight o'clock on this particular day at this hotel. We should make it at nine or nine thirty. Otherwise we got people sitting around smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee on the clock because the venue was not able to handle it. There are situations where in many large venues and convention centers where you've got to get marshalling papers before you can even bring a truck in. And if you just pull up with your semi at 8 o'clock on Monday morning and you don't have marshalling papers, you're not going to get a dock space. Yeah. That and what happens is, is we're already starting off bad. Now, Wallace, I'm picking the worst possible examples here just to make a point. Um, I had one guy who says, you know, he said, I had one time where, where the president of the United States was coming through town and we didn't know it. And Secret Service had blocked off all access to the convention center for two hours. Now, that's a really off-the-wall one. I'll be the first to admit it. <laughs> but it's those things that we didn't think about that bite us in the rear end. So you got people skills, kind of scope management skills. Um, what about budget and cost management? How, how critical is that from a project manager's responsibility, or is that the project manager's responsibility, I should ask? I would say yes, as long as that project manager has the ability to find out what else is going on at that venue during the time when we're supposed to be there. Acts of God, power going out, something like that. Obviously, no one can uh, predict that. But there is other situations, like we used to ask is, what else is, again, I think I said this earlier, what else is going on in the building? If you've got five other shows going on and there's a big convention coming in and there's a booth show coming in where there's 15 or 20 tractor trailers outside. Also, you find out that you may not have clear access to what part of that convention center or convention hotel that you need because it's in use by someone else. This is all pre-work. Everything we're talking about right now is pre-work. And the extent to which a project manager goes, it just depends on how big the show is. I mean, if you're doing, let's say you're not doing a main tent or a general session. Let's say you've got 25 meeting rooms to do. Well, how the heck are you going to cover those meeting rooms? How many runners are you going to have? And if they're at one end of the building or the other and someone needs another microphone or a projector lamp burns out, are you going to have to send someone an eighth of a mile down the hall to get it? Wouldn't it be better if you had pre-planned with the venue to have equipment closets along the way? Places where we can stash the most often requested items that weren't on the client's order. That's something else too. Booth shows are the same way and change management is the most important thing in the world. And I don't have to tell you about that. You'll have clients at a large, where you've got 250 booths, which is a big show. And you have people ordering equipment that they did not have the authorization to order. 
That should have all been set up at the beginning. Before the show was ever signed into contract, the change management plan or ordering plan has to be in place. Otherwise, people will ask for something, and if they don't, aren't forced to pay for it, they're not going to normally do it. I need another monitor. I need this. Well, who are you? Are you willing to sign for it? Do we already have your credit card information? In other words, it goes along the whole, the whole world of what we do. It's not just maintenance. It's not just meeting rooms. It's not just, it's everything we do because we're dealing with clients and we're dealing with people we don't know. We're trying to do a good job and, and make them ask us back, but also we don't want to go lose money. And if our systems, including risk management, which is what a lot of this falls under, Wallace, to be honest with you. You sit down before and go, what if? What if this happens? What if we can't get this here? What if? What is going to be our plan A and our plan B to take care of it? And different companies handle it differently. But it's across the board. And like I said, project management is not singular to AV. It's in every business. Every business has to deal with unknowns. And at the same time, keeping our clients happy. And it can, I don't have to tell you, it can get difficult sometimes. Indeed, indeed. So looking at the project management uh, process, the, the life cycle of project management in which, you know, you have a document that, you know, we're going to share in the show notes and that you're looking at here. Walking through the process, you got the initiation process, the preparation process, the execution process, and the closing process. Yes. Um, the Let's talk quickly important. about, uh, you know, what each of those processes are just at a high level. Um, and then I want to hear from you, which process, which part of this process do you feel project managers struggle the most? Well, of all of them, initiation, present, uh, preparation, execution, and closing, you should spend 60% of your time on preparation. And people say, well, wow, my goodness, that's an awful lot to spend on preparation. I said, it's the only way you can hedge your bets about things that you don't sure might change because they're going to change. And on top of that, the company should keep a record of every show that they do. And when I say every show that they do, let me see if I can make that uh, clear. I had worked for one company years ago who, who found that they made their most profit and had their best response from clients when they did shows that were this type or this rough amount of income. And that it, they found that out by practicing good project management. And then at the end of the year, sitting down and going back through those shows. And you know what? We never have time to do this, do we? Never have time to go back and look at what we've done. We have a tendency when a client comes to us with a new event, we find the one that's closest to it that we've done in the past. And we have a tendency to go with that one. Why? Because it's easier. And it's just human nature to do that. Not realizing the changes that might occur. Because we, 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 we sell them as if they're similar, but budget as if they're different. And this can sometimes put a real uh, problem in there, not only with the client's opinion of the AV company, but the fact is, well, this is how we did it six months ago and it worked real well, so let's just do that. And oftentimes in the heat of battle, AV companies say they're too busy. We don't have time to go back and look at this. Well, the ones that are most successful seem to have found time. And then they start finding out, what shows do we want and which ones do we really not want? If our cross rentals are going to exceed our income, all righty, we, we, the client or the boss may make a decision. We're going to do this because we're trying to get this work. But this is not something we want to consider when we're getting an 11% profit margin over something we should be getting 45% off of because companies fall into habits. And it's because they're not going back and looking at what the past is telling them. And that's difficult, and I'll be the first to, it, uh, to admit it. And the many times I've taught project management class, I hear that from owners as well as technicians. Oftentimes, we're so busy going from one to the other. And I says, that still is not a reason not to keep adequate records. And when things do close down, one company I know up uh, on the East Coast, every uh, Christmas, before they let everyone for Christmas off, they get the whole group in there, their technical department. They serve pizza and beer, and they go over the one dozen biggest shows they did this year and found out what worked and what didn't. 
And it's because they kept those kind of records. They kept all of the logic network diagrams. They kept all of everything and they go, wow, there's a trend here. <laughs> and it may be a good trend or it may be a bad trend. Another thing you look at is, are you able to keep your good people? And that's always been a problem in our industry. Oftentimes, AV is a seasonal business. And if we burn up our best people, eventually they're going to leave. And there's another tenant of project management say, never make any of your technicians a hero. In other words, we can't do this show without Bob. You mean Bob. Superman syndrome? Yes. The <laughs> super, you hit it on the, on the nose, my friend. Uh, the Superman yeah. syndrome. Actually, that scares techs more than it helps them. If they think they're the only ones who can do this and they're not going to get any rest, then they may not stay as long at your company as they would otherwise. It does not help the situation to have that Superman complex or that hero complex. And it's not the tech's fault. The company has made them that way. Yeah, yeah. And again, I, I, I've found that sometimes with... Uh... Yes, with the text, because, you know, I got to have this guy. Yep. Um, but even so, from a, a sales and project management relationship, I got to have this project manager. And it's like, oh, okay. Um, but I, I'll save that conversation for, uh, for another show. But I, do, <laughs> I, I, I got a question in the life cycle process when we look at initiation, because I don't think a lot of folks understand what the project manager's role is in initiating a project. And, and some of this could be due to org structure and, and how much ownership um, the account manager has. But when it comes to the initiation process, what is the role of the project manager or, or what should it be, I should say, um, in that initiation of a project? Well, Let's see how I can put this delicately. Oftentimes, the project manager is not even included in that. And I'm sorry, but that, that's a bad way to start. The salesperson has a different set of goals than the project manager. Their job is to sell that show, what, promise them whatever. We want to give them quality. But that seems to have been a gap that has existed for years, Wallace, to be honest with you between sales and operations. And while we, uh, we don't ever expect the two sides to ever meet exactly in the middle, it seems like the more successful companies at least have a closer relationship in the initiation phase by bringing a project manager in during the sales part of it, just so they can get background on what's going on. Now, it depends on the management hierarchy of the company, doesn't it? Now, if the boss says, I don't care if we lose money, we need this client. All righty, that's the same thing. A decision has been made. <laughs> we know we're not going to make a lot of profit on this first show, but we're out there to really wow the, the customer. Now, if, if, that is, if that is the way management wants to do it, then that takes the heat off of some of the people in both the project management department and in the operational department. All righty. We know we may not make a killing on this, but our job is to get this client on this. So we may change how we do things. Here is the key to project management. And uh, to be honest with you, this is the biggest problem I found in trying to get it um, implemented in a large company is, is if it has to be top down, it has to come all the way from the boss on down and it has to be practiced throughout the system for it to work. If the operations department is involved in it, but the boss isn't, then it's not going to be successful. The, one of the most important parts, and we had mentioned earlier briefly, is keeping records of every major show you do and then go back and look at them once the heat is off and the quiet time is here. That is when you start noticing, here's what we did well, here's what we could have done better. And you bring in everyone that has anything to do with it. That's why the Christmas party with, with, with beer and pizza seems to have worked for several companies that, that I have worked with before on, on how we get together when we're not in a work situation and let people talk. And it can up the quality of the company. I mean, that whole, uh, the triangle that you and I had mentioned in phone conversations is very important as far as project management goes. Yes, the holy trinity. <laughs> the holy trinity of what we're trying to do. And uh, we can call ourselves the best company in the world, but if we're not doing well, our people aren't happy and the client isn't happy, then what's the point? 
That's right. The purpose, scope, time, and cost, not good, fast, and cheap. <laughs> exactly. It's similar, but it's not the same. And again, uh, I think I told you earlier, the thing that made me buy into it quickest was risk management. Absolutely. That Absolutely. is one of the things. What, what do we do in this case where we have to do it? And I mean, there's hundreds of different stories you could tell about how people have gotten around it. Uh, I mean, and, and again, I pick extreme examples sometimes, but um, a good friend of mine on one show, they had a very short turnaround time to get a fairly large AV show in, um, in the morning. And what they did was they, during their site survey, they found out there was another event going on in the uh, exhibit hall that they were supposed to put a main tent in, a general session in starting the next day and found out there was another AV company in there that was going out that night. And they were already pressed for time for the next day. So what they did was on the side survey, they got hold of the company and they said, look, when your riggers are bringing down the hanging points for your show, can we work out an agreement with you and with the, with the hands of when you're taking down your points, hang ours for us. We'll still pay you the, the rigging call. All right. But what that would does is that would save us two hours tomorrow morning in trying to set our points. So we have our riggers come in early. As the other company's points are coming down, our points are going up. The motors are hung head high. And then that's it. We're done for the night. We just saved two hours on the next morning. And this was done at a company I'd worked with a long time ago by um, actually uh, one of the salespeople who had come up with the great idea. And we, it's not something you do every day. But as long as they were down there, they were finding information that might help us. And this was a place where it really worked well for our company it got us going on the next day quicker than we would have been otherwise. So when you look at that and something like that in the execution process, um, you got a document here we're looking at. It's the, you know, labor and timeline, the logic network. Yes. And this is something that I feel probably a lot of companies aren't doing. And when we talk about the subject of scope creep, um, labor is probably the biggest area of, expanded creep and where things start to get a ride not yes. so much in terms of the deliverables but just hey now you're off schedule and here's the repercussions of overtime and double time and turnaround time and all this fun stuff um walk us through what this diagram is how it works and why it's super critical that it becomes a practice uh for project managers to execute events what it does is it gives every department the opportunity to be involved on the timeline. What, what you're looking at on the labor and time, the logic network diagram that you're talking about is for a one day event. And uh, it, you get in at eight o'clock in the morning, you have to be completely set. But I think, I think at five or six in the afternoon, <laughs> this starts out with a legal pad and, ink and pens, pens and paper. And what you do is first you establish the timelines. And then you start uh, putting in the what that has to be done. You might off to also refer to the work breakdown structure. That is another page that uh, I think you and I had talked about, which kind of precedes the logic network diagram. Every company should sit down and decide the, the, prod, the breakdown structure is always nouns. It's equipment. It's gear. You first have to write down what is it we're going to work with. And you break it down by departments, lighting, sound, video, camera. And then you proceed to the logic network where you're going, all right, here's our timeline. We have between eight in the morning and six to get ready for a dinner presentation. We already have done our logic, uh, excuse me, our product breakdown structure. We know what we need now. How many people and how much time is it going to take to do it? And that's the purpose of the logic network. It lets you, and, it, and again, this is all done longhand. Mm -hmm. There are systems online that will do this for you computer-wise, but most companies, they just sit down with a legal pad with their department heads and go, all righty, what has to be done? How many screens are going up? How are we doing the projectors? Are we putting them on scaffold? Are they going to be flying from the front of house truss? And with all of that input, you come up with how much time is it going to take us? And most importantly, how many people is it going to take? Yep. And you bring in all of your department heads when you're working the logic network. And also, this is something that you give to your boss. It wouldn't be the first time a client has called your boss at the office and said, 
how are your guys doing at the convention center down here? And there's nothing worse for the boss to go, ba 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 I haven't talked to him in a half an hour. <laughs> the project manager in the office or even the boss in the office should have a copy of that logic network. So if the client does call at 10 o'clock in the morning and say, where are we? That person they're calling at the office should only be able to need to say one or two things. We're on schedule or we're not. If the client can't get that information out of from calling someone at the office, that's a confidence problem. They may going, oh, gosh, is this AV company going to be ready by 530 this afternoon? Or, or uh, doors are supposed to op open at 630. We're having dinner and, it, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning. And, and now my boss is asking me. This is the client's boss is asking the person we're working with. How is it looking? And they need help. So there's another service we perform. We have to be able to say we are on schedule or we are half an hour off schedule or we're moving along fine. And if you look a little closer at the logic network, when uh, you will see a bunch of dotted lines, the dotted lines tell you in the logic network that if this crew is finished with this particular item, then they immediately go to this next one. This is effective management of labor. You don't have people standing around because you've worked in. You know, if the truss is, is, has, has been flown to trim, then the crew that was attaching the sound and the lighting immediately goes and starts setting screens. And everyone has a copy of this, and everyone knows what is going on. And again, and this is not anything we invented in AV. This is just part of, part of basic project management. Yep. How um, do you think it's an advantage to give something like this to a client? So that, you know, they are informed of where the milestones are and where they should be within the day. So when they walk in the room and they have that conversation with a project manager, um, they can kind of look and just say, hey, where are we in your map? They see if they're on schedule or off schedule. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I've been asked it before. And boy, I always have trouble coming up sometimes with the answer. It's actually meant for our internal use. Yep. And when you, you give anything to a client that's written down on paper, there's a certain amount of risk management involved indeed, indeed. so i would say it would be based by company now if you've got a good relationship with the client they're a good customer then and, and you can help boost their position by making this available to them it might be appropriate okay in some places they go no this is an internal document because now the customer will hold us to that that's right so i mean i guess it just depends on which side of the fence you're standing on at that particular uh thing but the main thing is to let the on-site pro, uh, project manager going, are we where we're supposed to be? It's 10 in the morning, and here's where we should be. If yeah. my boss calls me from the office and says, Andre, are we ready? Are we where we're supposed to be at 1030 in the morning? He wants to hear two words, yes or no. And if it's no, he's going to want to know, all right, we're getting creep. We're getting schedule creep now. Is this going to affect the show this evening that we have to be ready for by 6 o'clock? And then if that happens, then other, uh, other things may be done. I mean, other things may be happening. They may send more people from the office. They may ask for more crew. The idea is, is and especially if this is not a one-day setup, as the drawing, I think, that I sent you, what if this is a two- or three-day one? That's when you really see creep start to happen. Someone used to say, how long does it take to put a show in? I said, it takes exactly as much time as you're given. <laughs> exactly. And I've seen shows where we were given five days to put a show in. When we only needed three, it still took five days to put the show in because the crew had already fallen into that. Well, we got five days. We yeah, the, the mental, mental timeline is clicked in. We can, we can milk this thing. Exactly. Stretch it out. So. Exactly. And it's human nature. I mean, I don't even think it's purposeful, but um, we all have been caught in that at some time or another. Indeed, indeed. So I'll include the uh, copy of the work breakdown structure and the logic network for the uh, listening audience in the show notes uh, so you can have access to those files. So last uh, question on the main topic here that I, I want to talk about. You, you've talked about uh, when it comes to the closing uh, phase of the project and you've talked about going back, look at, looking back at the, the project documents um, to understand what made sense of the project, why it worked, why it didn't work. Um, in those documents, I think most companies have these reports, whether they're using them or not, different story, um, but the details that are on them vary greatly. So in that information, you want to look back at to determine what was successful, what was not successful, and, and the details around it. What is information a project manager should be capturing 
um, in the post-show details or collecting in the post-show details to store and look back at? What are, the, what are those details that companies should be collecting and documenting in that closing process? Well, and in the closing, and again, to be honest with you, this is something companies never do because they don't have time. And I, I hate to preface with that, but even back when I was working shows, we always say we're going to get together a week from now and we're going to talk about what, you know, what worked and what didn't. But it's that simple. In other words, situations like we're constantly having a problem on, uh, let's say, getting time to, uh, to set the video projectors. We're constantly having problems doing this. We can't get the room dark enough. The banquet setup crew is in there trying to set up dinner. And we end up working all trying to get our screens looking good in a situation like this. And it says, well, th there is something that there is not a direct answer for. It depends on the client's timeline. Now, the most far reaching I'd ever take, seen this taken was a company actually set up the screens and the projectors in their shop before they went and got the projectors dialed in to 90% based on distance and screen size. So when they got there, once they had them hung, they were able to appreciably cut some time down of the final uh, situations of doing it. I've also seen situations, and we've seen this before too, where if you're hanging screens from the ceiling, you hang Black Visqueen behind them so that you can actually still focus and set up those projectors while other lights are on in the room. Uh, Wallace, the list could go on and on of what is, what is, possibilities of how we would do it. If that is the common problem, first you have to work out, is that the common problem? Or is it mismanagement of timing? Is it expecting too much to happen in the amount of time? That's often a situation. And again, this is not, I don't want to use the word fault, but was enough time given to put the show in in the first place? Or do we walk in knowing, uh-oh, we're going to be under the gun? And sometimes I don't know how to get out of that or around that. And it's been, it's been served up on a plate to me many times. Andre, we know you needed a day and a half. We've, we've only got 12 hours to get this thing in. And that's when we start sitting down. What can we pre-label? What can we pre-pack? Uh, if we know we're running into this situation and don't do anything about it, then shame on us. Or don't take the gig. If the company can't do it, I mean, uh, we've seen AV companies, I'm sure you've run into this, where you're working all night. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're getting in at 8 o'clock in the morning, and at 3 the next morning, you're still working for a show that the doors are supposed to open at 7.30 the next morning. Now, the, the company uh, should be able to prepare for this. You work someone 18, 20 hours, they're not going to be at their sharpest. So you start, um, you come up with a plan. That is, if you've given yourself enough time to come up with that plan, and if it fits in the budget. If you need six more people to come in at midnight because you can't get fixed. Now, that now affects the budget, which affects everything. And it's not something that can be easily worked out with a pencil and paper in 10 minutes. Yeah, it, yeah you got to sit down and, and map it out and think about it in deep you detail. You have to map it out and go, what if, what if, what if? And how can we get around this thing if we can't? So in capturing kind of that closing process, you know, what I picked up from that is, you know, really it's like a, a what worked, what didn't work, two column document you can make um, with sections of equipment, uh, trucking logistics, uh, timeline, Crew. people, how many people? Uh, yeah, budget. Um, and look at those key factors on the project and just say what worked, what didn't work, what worked, mm -hmm. what didn't work. Um, and, and summarize that into a, a lessons learned. But like I say, the critical part, even after capturing that detail, is actually sitting down, looking at it, analyzing it, and applying it to future projects so that you don't make the same mistakes twice. You know what? I, I, I would say you hit, it up, hit the nail on the head. Uh, I mean, you could have 100 people working on a stage, but they couldn't all be working. And I mean, this goes back to... The, uh, I keep trying to think of an example that's not off color. It was presented to me by a PMP once, and please take this in the right method. How you plan your labor and how you plan your setup uh, has a lot to do with how many people can actually be working in that one area. And the joke he used, and again, I don't believe this is off color, so I'll say it, edit it out if you don't like it, but one woman can have a baby in nine months, three women can't have a baby in three months. 
And this is something we don't often take into consideration. It's the old story of your son comes home from schools and with a great report card and opens the front door and, and the, the doorknob puts a hole in the drywall. How long does it take to fix that drywall? And most people will say, well, it takes 15 minutes. I get out my spackle and I fix it. No, it actually takes a day because you got to put a coat of spackle on that hole, let it dry overnight, come back hit it with another coat and then paint it. And that was the way it was put to me by a, a PMP once saying is you can have a hundred people, but they can't all be working at the same thing on the same time, the same amount of space. And having too many people is as bad as not having enough. Yep. Because if the client doesn't see their labor working, then they're going to have a tendency to want to question the bill or ask why there's people not doing anything. And that's one of the most difficult things to plan. One of the most difficult. Yeah, that, that's a show by itself. <laughs> you know what? You're right. Uh, that could be, itself. Wallace, an actual show by itself. How do you keep your labor occupied? It's not the labor's responsibility to do that. It's the AV company's responsibility to have a timeline, a breakdown saying this is what needs to be done. This is when it needs to be done by. Then go to their labor supplier and be honest with them and say, this is what we're trying to do and get help from them. Yeah, we'll definitely dive deeper into that on a future show. So we're going to jump to what I call the final five on live. And these are just some quick spitfire questions, no deep thought um, to get uh, some more information about you and in, in, in your journeys over the years. So who outside of the AV industry has inspired you the most? Well, you know, I had to think long and hard about that. I really did. Uh, but because you said outside of the AV industry and, you know, I've got to say it was my father. Uh, he instilled a work ethic in all the kids. I mean, he had us working when we were 12 years old because he said, that's what life is about is producing something. So I would have to say it was still my dad the most that, that got all of us kids going. You will not be sitting around and be indolent your entire life. You must work uh, for life to give you anything back. And uh, that was something I always remembered. Uh, I didn't like it much when I was 12 years old, but uh, <laughs> I certainly understood the importance of it later. So I'd have to say my dad was the most influential on that. Very cool. Uh, you've traveled a lot over the years. Um, what is the, your favorite place that you've eaten on the road? Oh, New Orleans. And I'll just any, any particular restaurant there? Galatoire's. All right. Galatoire. I mean, I can eat my way from one end of the French quarter to the other without even looking twice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so what is your favorite city that you've traveled? Well, I guess I'd have to say London. Okay. London, England. And again, uh, I've never lived there, but I visited there a few times, always on work and always found it a fascinating city. Uh, so much like uh, our country and yet so different in so many other ways. Interesting. Uh, favorite movie of all time? And you're, you're going to think I'm crazy. Lawrence of Arabia. Really? Yeah, I thought that would take you off guard for a moment, my that friend. That would, that would. I, I, I've heard a couple of these now, so that definitely the first for that one. Yeah, we'll do uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> so last question. Um, if you did not get in the AV industry, which you've been in, seems like your whole life and career, um, what would you be doing? I was on my way to becoming an architect. Interesting. Before I took a hard left turn into show business. Never looked back. Interesting. First time I've heard architect on this as well. So oh, cool. very cool. Um, so where can the listeners find you on the web or various social networks to connect with you? Um, you know, see what you're doing, have going on um, with Avixa. Um, where, where can they find you on the web and connect with you? Well, mostly uh, just, you know, getting hold of Avixa. Most of you remember it as Infocom. We're still calling it the wrong thing. I still occasionally say Infocom. And, and, and by the way, the show, the annual show we do will still be called Infocom. That but the company correct. name has been changed to Avixa. And again, I'm available. You just go to Avixa website, look under the instructors in there, and on my picture and my email address and everything is plastered. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Andre, for enlightening the Live Life audience with a lot of great information regarding the importance of project management. And uh, we'll definitely be talking again about more specific topics on this subject um, on future shows ahead. So, folks, that is a wrap. And thank you for listening. Uh, please subscribe to the show um, on iTunes so that you don't miss an episode. And we'd love to get your feedback. So please leave us a review uh, there as well. 
Uh, you can shout us out on Twitter using the hashtag The Live Life. And uh, stay tuned for more great episodes.